we, we talk of following Jesus. We talk of taking your cross. We talk of leading and being led to the cross. We talk of laying our cares at the foot of the cross for the sake of the gospel. Last week, we talked about being in the wilderness and how Jesus is there with us to lead us by the hand out of our wilderness. And we talked about taking the time of Lent to look within ourselves and find the things keeping us in that wilderness, turning them over to Christ and letting Him walk us into the kingdom of God. And that's important for us since we were not made to stay in the wilderness, but what do we do? What must we let go of to get out of this wilderness? What can we do to take Jesus' hand and allow Him to lead the way? Well, let's read our scripture for today and see what Jesus has to say. So I invite you to turn to Mark, it's chapter 8. We're looking at verses 31 to 38. It's on page 1,438 in your pew Bibles. So it's Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. It's page 1438 in the Pew Bible. Now, as usual, I'm going to give you a little background on what's happening. At the end of chapter 7, Jesus heals a deaf-mute man. And then chapter 8 starts with Jesus feeding the 4,000. Now, this is different than the 5,000. This is another time. But he feeds the 4,000, and then he's warning his disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees and he heals a blind man. And then comes the story of Peter answering the question, who do people say I am? And Peter answers, he says, you are the Messiah. Now Mark just glazes over that and says, and Jesus said, "Don't, don't tell them anymore. Don't tell the people what you've said. The other gospels say, you're right, but the information you have didn't come from humans. It had to come from the Holy Spirit. And this brings us to where we are. So it's Mark 8, starting with verse 31. It's on page 1438. So verse 31 says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now remember, this is right after Peter just got an attaboy for saying that Jesus was the Messiah. Read verse 32. Now, none of the, none of the Gospels really say what, what Peter said to Jesus or, you know, anything. We don't know. All we know is that Peter rebuked Jesus. He just said he's the Messiah, and now Peter is rebuking Jesus for saying, telling him what must happen. Verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Remember, he just got the pat on the back for saying that recognizing Jesus as Messiah, now it's get behind me, Satan. I mean, how fast can we fall? Read verse 34, please. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Verse 36, please. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Verse 38. Let's pray. Lord, help us to trust you so that we may give our life to you. Show us ways to serve you. Fill us with your grace and love. We pray this. Amen. So to answer our question, what must we do in order for Jesus to lead us out of the wilderness? Well, what did Jesus say to do? Take up your cross and follow him. 
That's it? That's all I have to do. But how do I do that? How do I take up my cross? How do we do that? Well, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? Because it's not as easy as we would like to think. In August of 2003, the Church of the Holy Cross in New York City was broken into twice. In the first break-in, thieves made away with a metal uh, money box that had been resting next to a votive candle rack. Three weeks later, vandals escaped with something much more valuable. They unbolted a four-foot-long, 200-pound plaster Jesus from a meditation area, taking the statue of Christ, but leaving behind his wooden cross on the wall. Now, the, the, the church caretaker, David St. James, confessed his bewilderment at this. Mr. St. James said, they just decided we're going to leave the cross and take Jesus. We don't know why they took just him. We figure if you want the crucifix, you take the whole crucifix. In other words, Mr. St. James was saying, if you want Jesus, you take his cross too. It's a bit embarrassing to admit this, but... I kind of understand the choice of those thieves. I like the figure of Jesus. I like the clever and compassionate way that he treated people. I admire the clarity and balance of his ethical teaching. I love his stories. And I know I'm not alone. Uh, recently, I asked a group, what's the most attractive characteristic of Jesus? His love, his compassion, his warmth, his caring, his patience. These were some of the answers. But no one said, I like how stern he is, or how he always talked in parables, or how strict he could be. I wonder why we don't pick those characteristics. Well, actually, I do know why, and I think you do also. You see, the character of Christ is the ideal of health and wholeness toward which I want to grow more and more. The whole world would be better if more of us lived Christ's way. And according to most every study I read, millions of people, even those who hardly ever darken the door of a church or have serious questions about God, well, they're, they're quite attracted to the figure of Jesus. As for his cross, that's a little more complicated. See, some of us prefer not to get too close to that. It's the same reason why we don't instantly say that we love Jesus because He told us to take up our cross and follow Him. Oh, we'll mention the follow Him part, but not the take up your cross part. There's another reason I'm inclined to take Jesus and leave the cross. There are times when I just want to look at the cross and take in how Jesus suffered for me. See, the cross fills me with awe and gratitude. I don't, I don't fully understand why Jesus would voluntarily choose to die to pay the price for my sins. And along with millions of Christians around the world, I've often thought, thank God that Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. So then I asked the group, what does take up your cross mean to you? And these answers varied also living more like Jesus, sharing the gospel, walking the walk and talking the talk, and doing the difficult things that God tells us to do. These were some of the answers that I got for what does it mean to take up your cross. Unfortunately, it goes much deeper than this. It involves us literally putting our lives on the line for the sake of the gospel. If you think of Jesus talking to the disciples at that time, we know the story that comes afterwards, but they did not. When Jesus said they had to take up their cross, he literally meant you will have to go to the cross and die for the sake of the gospel. And we don't look at it that way. We don't remember what they had to do for the sake of the gospel. Another reason many of us might leave the cross where it stands is because, see, we don't want to shed any of our own blood. 
We like the figure of Jesus. We like being forgiven people, but we aren't sure we want to follow or be formed by Jesus if it means being put on our own cross like the disciples did. But following Jesus doesn't mean we have to take up our cross. Following Jesus does mean we have to take up our cross. The forgiveness of sin and the blessing of eternal life comes through accepting what Jesus did on his cross. But truly following Jesus, being formed into the image of Jesus and knowing his abundant life, well, that comes through accepting what we must do with our cross. We must be ready and willing to put our lives on the line and to allow ourselves to be nailed to a cross for the sake of the gospel. To kind of bring that into our time so you can see how it works. Vicki told me a story about her relative who is a pastor in New York whose ministry is in the worst parts of the city, the parts that we wouldn't dare go into. And she told me a story about how this one time he was driving down the road and his car is not the, in the best shape and, and that reliable. But what, he saw something that was going on and he stopped the car and he started yelling at the people involved to stop what they were doing. And Vicki told me how the others in the car feared what might happen and they reminded the pastor that he wasn't that young anymore and maybe he should be more careful about who he's telling how to live. But you see, he's doing what Jesus told us to do. Take up your cross and follow him. Follow Jesus into the unsavory parts of society and not let fear of what might happen prevent you from doing God's work. Don't be afraid of the consequences but you live your life for the sake of the gospel. Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? I heard a message by Reverend Peter Height that was provocatively entitled, Marriage, a Sneaky Way to Get a Person Crucified. At first, the title seemed crazy to me. What in the world does marriage have to do with crucifixion? And then I thought about it, and I realized the answer, a lot. I mean, you don't sign up for marriage because you're thrilled about the prospect of learning to deny yourself or losing your old way of life. You don't go into, you don't go into marriage thinking, oh good, this is going to be really hard. Thank goodness I'll finally have all my character flaws pointed out to me every day to me, and my selfishness pinned to me like a banner. That chuckle was a little too loud. <laughs> See, nobody goes into marriage or any other covenant in life because they're eager to take up a cross. Who would voluntarily sign up for a summer camp whose symbol was a giant mosquito? Come to Camp Stinger. Your blood is our business. Makes me want to go right away. I'm sure some of you have been to summer camp like that, but this is not attractive. But when I listen to the way of Jesus, it seems that crazy. Turn the other cheek. Pray for those who persecute me. Visit the criminal in prison. Give my hard-earned money to a beggar. No way. It's unrealistic. It's overly demanding. It's, it's hard to walk that way in life. Shoot, Jesus even implies in verse 38 that when, he, when we perceive how hard and, and countercultural his way is, we might actually be ashamed of his words. We might be tempted to dilute, diminish, or domesticate his teaching. And this isn't something new. People have been wrestling with this for years. When writing in the 5th century A.D., Augustine of Hippo wrote, It is necessary to die, but nobody wants to. We want to reach the kingdom of God, but we don't want to travel by way of death. And yet there stands necessity saying, This way, please. It's crucial to remember that Christ's purpose in calling us to take up our cross is that we might live more fully. He calls us to die to our old selves so that his self, his heart, his soul, his mind, and his strength 
might be more fully alive in us. You see, Jesus is begging his followers not to trade down in life while foolishly thinking they're trading up. He's saying, don't buy into this gain the whole world more for me mentality that is the rage of humanity in every century. You'll only forfeit your soul. You're shot at the most real and rewarding and renewing kind of life. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their lives for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. What are you willing to lose your life for? Or better yet, what are you willing to lose yourself doing? You know what that's like, to be so focused, so wrapped up in something or someone that you don't notice the passing of time. You don't notice that you're hungry or sleepy or exhausted. You don't notice anything but that thing, that activity, that person. You've lost yourself. And what if that thing was the gospel? Not the words on the page or in the book, but a life of fully living those words. What if loving one another as we've been loved became something we invested our whole self into? And what if the whole church decided to do this? What transformation could take place in our community if that was the sole focus of the church? To love others as we have been loved? Or are we like those thieves in the story I told earlier? Do we think we can have Jesus without the cross? Do we practice a crossless Christianity? These are some heavy questions to ponder, but they're necessary ones to think about, especially as we try harder to be a church that serves the community, a church that welcomes everyone who walks through the doors, a church that wishes to grow, to thrive, and to survive in the future. We must not be afraid of our cross. We must be willing to lose our life for the sake of the gospel, for then we will be saved. Let's pray. O oh God of great compassion, thank you for your presence with us, especially during seasons of suffering. Forgive us for the times we've turned aside from those who suffer. May we be conduits of your love and mercy to those in physical, emotional, or spiritual pain. Help us discern what we need to put aside so that we can be more faithful followers of Jesus. Show us the cross we need to bear and give us the courage knowing that you are with us to bear that cross for the sake of the gospel. Jesus, take our hands and lead us where you want us to be, both individually and as a church body. We pray this in your matchless holy name. Amen. Now we.